everyone wants to put on a bit more muscle and have a highly attractive physique. And this isn't a bad thing, especially when you consider that there is a certain element that your physical body plays into people when they subconsciously size you up or judge the book by its cover. Many people will say, oh, there's more than looks and will call you crazy for or self-absorbed for caring that much about how your body looks. And I would argue these people just don't realize the importance that this can play in first impressions. This is called the halo effect. And the halo effect is a psychological phenomenon that makes people trust more attractive people over others. So building muscle and having an aesthetically appealing body to others, at least to where they can appreciate it, can actually be a really big life benefit, especially in today's like modern world where everything seems to, you know, just look at how does somebody look? Everything is visual right in your face all the time. And so if you are a person that you do care about your looks, you like myself have probably tried everything you can to gain muscle only to watch months and months go by and you're still small. However, many people, including myself for a long time, will do everything that you can to gain muscle and it seems like no matter what you do, you're still small or you're at least you don't have the look or you're, you're not the size or you haven't built the amount of muscle that you thought you would up at least until this point. I personally always wanted a commanding presence and if you are like me, you want some of that right? You want, you want the small form of respect that comes from people when they notice somebody that has clearly put a lot of effort into their body and into their look. There is a certain amount of admiration that people do give you when you get to a certain point. And for me, a few years back, I was stuck and I couldn't seem to gain muscle at the rate that I wanted to. And I knew I was leaving some on the take, but I just didn't know what. And so I did a deep dive and I found that there are five really common ways that prevent people from getting absolutely yacked. And I addressed all of these and got tr way more results from it. Rather, from what I was doing before, I mean, I've been an athlete my whole life, but I hadn't really focused on my physique. It was all performance. So there does come a few different things that you need to do in order to optimize for your physique than just for overall health and strength and performance. So that's what I'm talking about here. So I'm not going to get into an argument with anybody about, you know, oh, well, you know, if you do all these compound lifts, then you're going to also work the stabilizer muscles. I don't give a shit about stabilizer muscles. I care about growing muscle and that's it. Strictly looks. Okay. And so these things that you do today, if you fix them, I promise in six months, if you are making these mistakes now, you will have a significant impact on your look. And yes, six months, this shit takes time and all these small changes, it's like compound interest. At first you won't see a whole lot, but then over time, the results are absolutely dramatic. So if you were expecting a quick fix, this isn't the video for you. These tips are for the people who plan on actually committing to this and doing the work and consistently putting it in over time to achieve the result that they want to. Let's get in to problem number one, which is you aren't tracking anything. What isn't measured isn't managed. You have to think of muscle growth and building a, a great physique that you're proud of, kind of like a business. If a business doesn't know its profit or isn't profiting, it's not even a business. If a business doesn't track its cost, labor, inventory, assets, etc., then it can't know what exactly its profit is in the direction that it's going. More lean tissue is the profit in this case. Fat, you could consider debt. Now, when you bulk, you do have to take on a little bit of debt, which gives leverage, which is what a lot of smart businesses do. They use debt as a form of leverage to increase muscle growth and create a more anabolic environment for the body. And people will say, yeah, bro, I'm bulking. I've been eating everything in sight. But if you aren't gaining muscle or you're not going up in weight, then you aren't bulking. And the truth is there are countless fitness gurus that'll tell you how, you know, you don't have to track calories to get in shape or get jacked. But my main argument with this is I've seen very, very few people be able to do it in terms of getting jacked and getting a 
like a world class or at least a top tier physique for their genetic profile. Now, if we're talking like you want to lose weight and look good naked, yes, you don't may not have to track. But if you are trying to optimize to get the best physique that you can, because I personally am all about efficiency, then you will need to track everything because it is going to be that much easier to course correct when things go wrong. You'll be able to look at your training, for instance, and you'll notice, oh, I haven't really went increased weight on any of my lifts in a month. That's an issue. You have to consistently make shit harder over time. That is progressive overload. Consistent logbook progressions. Let's say you're not gaining weight. Oh, I'm eating at maintenance because I've been tracking my weight, eating, you know, 2,700 calories a day, and I haven't gone up in weight. So maybe I do need to go up to about 2,900 to 3,000 calories so I can start gaining weight in the manner that allows my body to be in an environment that promotes muscle growth. So for my, the first few years for me, I was hopping from program to program not tracking anything. I was on bodybuilding.com doing, I think it was Steve Cook's big man on campus. Um, Jim Stefani had some, but I was just hopping from, you know, program to program, but I wasn't tracking any of my lifts. Therefore I didn't make any progress. And there's a whole other side of the brain that goes involved in this that I might do at a separate time, just to kind of explain why you need to do the same lifts over and over again. But gains don't happen from jumping from program to program, doing exercise, exercise, doing what this fitness influencer is doing to maintain their muscle, not even grow it. So you're already being lied to on that end. And But the gains come from consistent tracking of the meticulous details. That's not fun at first, but it is simple and it is easy to do once you get into the habit of it. So with that being said, problem number two, you aren't eating enough. If you are the type you've stayed at the same weight or had the same physique or haven't grown or it's been insanely slow, which isn't a bad thing, it's still progress, but you're not eating enough. And I know how it feels. I hate force feeding myself when you don't have to. That is the shitty thing about bulking is you have to force feed yourself. And for me, it actually, it's worse to force feed than to not eat enough. I would rather cut than bulk for days, but it is a necessary evil. And sometimes you have to force feed yourself. That is if you were also trying to maybe optimize for health. Now you could go to five guys, you could go get the worst food on the planet, dirty, you could dirty bulk. And that would definitely help. And you would certainly gain weight. But if you are not gaining weight, you are not eating enough. Regardless of what the macro calculator says on your calories, if you're not growing, you're not eating enough. And I had a teammate in college, one of my best friends, you know, he would always talk about how he has this trouble gaining weight. And he's like six foot four. He was like 160 pounds. So not a very big guy. And I remember, you know, he'd be like, dude, I'm eating pizza for lunch. And then I'm eating Freddy's, which is just a fast food chain for dinner every single day. And so I, you know, we sat there and we talked and, you know, I thought about it and I was like, well, dude, you you know, we're practicing, you know, batting practice starts at two. We don't get out of practice till six. We also have 5 a.m. workouts. I mean, you're on the move eight hours a day and you're a catcher and a pitcher and running a ton. So you're using every single bit of those calories that you're putting in. That's why you're not gaining weight. It's not necessarily the food quality It is the overall amount of volume of food that you are not eating. So what happened is he actually started just doing the gallon of milk a day. Lo and behold, he gains freaking 10 pounds in like a month, which might be a little fast, but regardless for him, he needed to gain that weight. And that's my point is if you are not gaining weight, Your body's using all the energy, so you need to give it excess so it knows what to do with the raw materials that you're putting in, in this case food, and give it a chance to actually grow your body because after a certain point, you know, you only recover up to baseline. You have to feed your body with what it needs to actually go above the baseline, okay? So number two, you're probably not eating enough. Number three, you're not stimulating the muscle enough when you are training. And I'm serious when I say this, have you tried trying? And I mean, actually trying, trying is a two part equation. It's effort plus time, right? So you can try really hard for one workout, but that doesn't count as trying. Trying requires also a certain amount of, um, commitment to a certain program or lifestyle that you are trying to achieve. So you have to allow your body a chance to become an environment. And I've said this a couple of times throughout this, you have to give it a chance to become an environment that is conducive for growth. 
So there's always a lag time. So really, I mean, your body needs a week or two to really start getting into that mode of, okay, I guess we're going to be getting these excess calories. So how do we set up the infrastructure so that we can start growing muscle? When, you know, since we are doing this, that's why it takes time for you to see noticeable results from bulking. Okay. So you, one, you got to give it at least two to three weeks to, for your body to be set up. And then you have to actually train hard, which is the other piece. So you have to train in a way that is close to failure. It doesn't have to be exactly at failure. However, the paradox is if you're not used, if you don't know when you're two, one, two, three reps shy of failure, you probably actually need to spend some time going to failure with good technique so that you can then learn what one to two reps shy is. Because the problem with going to failure a lot of times is people just aren't accustomed to it. And your body has to get into a mode where it is going there. But if you are not have not consistently performed at that level, you might actually hurt your progress because you're going to recover just in time for your next workout. But you didn't allow any time for growth to actually happen. However, I don't really see that usually being the issue. Normally, it's people just are not going hard enough in the gym to actually elicit a muscle growth response. So you have to nail your technique to where all you're focused on is solely stimulating the muscle that you are trying to work. This is why I do love machines. From a the standpoint of growing muscle, I do think machines tend to be a better bang for your buck because you're not focusing on all the other stability um, aspects of a particular lift. You can only focus on the output of the muscle, which ultimately is what is going to drive that stimulus to elicit a muscle growth response or hypertrophy for some of you nerds. And lifting is a skill. It's kind of like walking. Like walking was a very difficult thing. Like it takes years for babies to be able to do that. Lifting can be the same thing. You have to be able to learn how to properly move, which connects to the brain so we can start you know, consistently doing these things. And it even takes time for your brain to be able to maximize how much output you can give on a certain lift. So lifting is a skill, learn how to use technique properly and actually stimulate the muscle. And, you know, my favorite resources for this are like uh, Jordan Shallow and Joe Bennett are two of my personal favorites that I like to listen to a lot. So I highly recommend Jordan Shallow, I think is um, the muscle doc on YouTube and Joe Bennett's hypertrophy coach. Number three, you're running a bro split. Now, before I get any flack here, I love bro splits. In fact, there's a reason they're still around because they do work. However, common advice is that you should train one body part at a time and absolutely demolish it. But the goal is not to demolish. It is to stimulate muscle protein synthesis and make your muscles more sensitive to amino acids and everything else that comes with building muscle. And muscle protein synthesis in untrained individuals or, you know, maybe suboptimal is typically going to be about 24 to 48 hours, whereas the more trained you get, the less that that the smaller that that window gets. So the sooner you typically will recover. So this doesn't mean that bro splits are useless. A fairly recent study has shown that a frequency doesn't necessarily have an impact as long as the stimulus and the volume requirements are there to grow muscle. So a lot of times, you know, if you're recovering pretty fast, so maybe instead of a bro split, I would recommend like an upper lower or a push pull leg split just so you can freak hit certain muscles more frequently. However, if you do like the bro split and you do like just hammering one muscle group at a time throughout the week, one day a week, it's still going to work. I'm not going to act like it's not going to, but once again, I do like efficiency. And as you're, you know, as you get to a more advanced stage, maybe the bro split would be more beneficial. However, I do find that more people could benefit from more frequency, primarily because of what I already talked about with the skill aspect of things. You are going to learn how to do certain lifts more and quickly because you are going through these movements more often and you can start to finally learn how to properly move to hit the muscle that you actually want to hit. And my other argument for maybe not doing a bro split right away until your technique and everything is like really dialed down is because as your sets progress and as fatigue starts to set in, your technique is going to break down, which then means you're not going to stimulate the muscle at the same level that you normally would with maybe only two sets, 
but two sets twice a week instead of four sets all at once. And this is what's known as junk volume. You're not really stimulating the muscle in any meaningful way. And so I do think that for beginners to intermediates, perhaps you know, an upper lower or a push pull legs might be a little bit more beneficial just so you can get the movement patterns down and get really good at stimulating muscle groups the way that you want to. And the last point that I make is you're, you're not making shit harder over time in a smart way. Smart is the key here. So there are smart ways to make things harder. And then there are dumb ways to make things harder. If your goal is physique based, then total tonnage or weight on the bar isn't necessarily as relevant. And I would argue, maybe you should try for rep PRs over an eight rep range rather than trying just to increase the weight. So I did power lift for four years, got to a very highly elite level, totaled over 1800 pounds, had a squat of 745 pounds. I had big legs, but I mean, I was always doing, you know, two, three, four reps during my prep. And then of course the off season, I would up the volume, but I think what people do when their goals are physique, they still think that for whatever reason, strength is relevant. And this, the literature kind of shows it doesn't really matter as long as you're kind of in that six to 20 rep range for, you know, six to 10 sets a week, you're going to be fine. So I think it, it also, there's the aspect of injuries, the heavier weight you go, the more likely you are to get injured. And part of what we need to do is make sure if you're trying to grow, We need to stay as injury-free for as long as we possibly can so you can continue to work longer because injuries kill gains more than anything else outside of obviously the eating and not sleeping enough and all that stuff. But injury is a very real prevention in getting certain gains. So that's why I I tend to argue, you know, say you hit a nine rep max on something, just keep with that weight, go for one rep over every single week up until you get to where you just hate doing the set. Like I don't like doing sets of 15. So I usually stop around 12 or 13. And then I go back, I go up 10 pounds and I start with that again. That would probably be a smarter way. Your job when it comes to training this way is to make as objective as a weight. So say 45 pounds for just easy scenario here. Your job is to make that as subjectively hard as possible. So how do you do that? You know, you get better technique. You maybe slow down tempo a little bit just so that, you know, you're also hitting the eccentric, which, you know, hitting both parts of the lift is just as important for hypertrophy as anything else. So, you know, slow on the eccentric, explosive on the concentric, because that's what's going to elicit more of a growth response. So make shit harder over time via rep maxes. And it's not to say you can't do, you know, go for a one rep every now and again, if that's your prerogative, but it's not going to be conducive to muscle growth and it really doesn't matter. So I hope this video helped. Feel free to leave questions in the comments. I hope you learned something from it. So if you did, please like the video till next time. Peace.